When I was in high school, we were given a year-long assignment where we would write a novel slowly throughout the year. I decided that my story was going to be the most epic story ever. It was going to be The Matrix meets a Robocop meets Terminator meets Cowboy Bebop. And my story sucked. It was just awful. I attempted to do way too much with the story. And I learned a lesson from that. And Sega learned that exact same lesson in 1983 with Congo Bongo. See, people mistakenly think of Congo Bongo as a Donkey Kong ripoff. And it's not. It was more than that, and it was attempting to be more than that. It just didn't do it well. What it was attempting to do was be an epic video game. It was attempting to mix the most popular games at that time, Donkey Kong, Frogger, and Zaxxon, into one epic masterpiece of a game. The only problem is, it bombed while attempting to do it. And Sega failing at this is a complete shame. Because whenever I found out about Congo Bongo, and I was under the impression that it was a Donkey Kong ripoff, I was so excited, because I love Sega ripoffs of other games. Golden Axe Warrior, I like better than The Legend of Zelda, and that's the biggest ripoff you can get. Even the ones that are just kind of reimaginings or contemporaries. Fantasy Star is much better than Final Fantasy, in my opinion. And that's why I'm a Sega fan. I like Sega's attempts at games better than the originals. But Congo Bongo is only one-third of a Donkey Kong ripoff. The other two-thirds are ripoffs of Sega's own games, and they just don't mix very well, even though they seem like they should on the surface. You see, the original Congo Bongo game is built off of the Zaxxon arcade game technology. It was using that isomorphic visual perspective for a Donkey Kong and Frogger type of game. So it was using an isomorphic perspective for platforming in 1983. As ambitious and impressive as that feat is, it just doesn't work out very well. This visual style makes judging distance and size and basically everything you need for platforming insanely difficult. So you will die a lot in Congo Bongo for things that really don't seem like your fault. And sadly, figuring out these distances and how to actually move your character turns into the game. The game isn't about getting to the end of the level, getting to the monkey. It is about figuring out how to play the game with its bad controls. And up until now, I'm actually just talking about the arcade game. They then took this and translated it to the SG-1000. And this made it even worse. Thankfully, you can kind of treat most of the game as a two-dimensional game, but it still has that three-dimensional aspect in it, which really makes the controls really tough to work with and actually very unresponsive. And now for the big however. However, despite all of these things that make Congo Bongo bad, it's these exact same things that make Congo Bongo insanely interesting and fantastic to look at. It was a sort of 2.5D isomorphic platformer in 1983. Making this type of game is really tough, and in fact we really didn't even get to where games were good enough using it to be mainstream games until the mid to the late 90s with things like Sonic 3D Blast, which although isn't a good game, it at least solved a lot of those problems. Congo Bongo was over a decade earlier. That's impressive. Another fact that's kind of interesting to note is this is so far only the second SG-1000 game that really has music during the game. Now keep in mind during this era, music in-game was not actually a given. So the SG-1000 port has two levels from the arcade's four levels. Once again, this is pretty typical of practice for the time. Most of the early Donkey Kong ports on home consoles had two levels. One of the things that made the Coleco version better was that it had three levels. So, it was pretty common practice. 
and you end up getting the Donkey Kong type level where you're platforming up, you're just kind of going over these ramps back and forth to get to the monkey at the top. Then you have one that's not quite the Frogger level, but it's still almost Frogger-esque, we're viewing it from above, so you get this two different perspectives, so it has a little bit of variation. But ultimately, it's just two levels. And this type of game, with as many problems as it has, can only be so fun for two levels. Although it is an impressive game in several ways, it is ultimately disappointing. Whether it's a short levels that just loop over getting a little bit more difficult, that's difficulty attached on to difficult controls. But it's just a disappointing entry for Sega's lineup, especially compared to what the Famicom had to offer at this time with Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. The Famicom had this genre of beat. It had it solid. As of now, the SG-1000's identity is definitely in shooters, such as N-Sub. And coming up, we're going to be looking at two more shooters that really solidify the system's shooter status in that era, with 30-40% to 40 being nothing but shooters in the first 10 releases, with Borderline being a kind of in-between shooter status.